<laughs> okay. Well, I need to forget that. It's so hard. Okay. It is Wednesday, April 10th. We are picking up in Revelation chapter 20. We are in verse 1. We're looking at a lot of background to understand what the Millennial Kingdom looks like because we saw that it is not Garden of Eden. Everything is wonderful from the moment that it begins. We've had cleanup that needs to take place. We've had uh, the, the carnage of war being burned, that sort of thing. But we also saw that there was criteria for the Millennial Kingdom to come into happening. The Millennial Kingdom being the will of God from heaven down on earth. Remember when Matthew 6, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on, heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're talking about. So it takes the coming of the Messiah for this to come into effect. We looked at this last week. He will rule and reign. When Messiah came the first time, he did not come to rule and reign. He came to deal with the sin issue. He came to be the sacrificial lamb. So we see the difference here. We saw that there has to be the conquest of the nations that puts Israel as head nation during this time. That comes because her Messiah's returned and finished off the, the enemies, the nations that were against her. Remember, this is culminated from the Battle of Armageddon, Armageddon where the battle's been going on through most of the length of Israel. And this battle being from, you know, about 200 miles and the, the blood uh, as high as a horse's bridle. We know that it is in the, literally in the valley of Armageddon. That's where we get the name <coughs> Armageddon. We know it's also in Jerusalem, in the valley of Jehoshaphat. But we saw a number of different locations that all culminates at that point when the Lord comes and finally puts his feet down on the Mount of Olives and it cleaves in two and he sets up his kingdom at that time. That's what we're talking about. So it takes him coming back to be the victor over those nations that have all converged on Israel, all wanting their peace, all wanting the way that, that they uh, want it to be. They don't want P-E-A-C-E. -E, they want a P-I-E-C-E, -E, peace of Israel. So not peace. But Messiah comes and brings them P-E-A-C, Shalom. And that is because the salvation of Israel comes. Those who are uh, believers who have made it through the tribulation, we're going to look at that, that they'll be entering into this millennial kingdom. We're going to look heavily today at who populates the millennial kingdom. Uh, but at this point, let me just say that uh, there are those who are... They've got to be coming to that point of being convinced of who the Messiah is, and they're going to see him coming. They're going to see the nail piercing, and it says they're going to realize and mourn for, for the one that they rejected, realizing, wow, he was, he is our Messiah. We've rejected him. They're coming into that moment of salvation right then at his return also. We read about them in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 is what I'm referring to. We, I think this is where we got uh, heavily into it last week. And toward the end of class, we see that during this millennial time, represented by the circle here on my chart, this is Satan's line. Right now, he's the prince of the power of the air. And at the time of the millennium, he is going to be under, in the abyss, in the pit. We're going to see that when we read verses 1 through 3 in just a few moments. So I won't say more now because we did last week. We went through all of what this difference means. So if you didn't, if you have any questions, either get last week's teaching or come see me and let me know. But Satan is going to be bound for the thousand years. That means that he's not going to be affecting the people like he does you and I today. He's not going to be whispering in their ear. He's not going to be deceiving them. He's not going to be spewing out lies. He is going to be powerless. Yes. <laughs> and it gets even worse for him and better for us. Okay. We saw that the believers have their reward when they came back with the Lord. They came back in the robes of righteousness, part of their reward. We know they've been at that judgment seat of Christ. Part of what they're told in the reward is that they will rule and reign with the Lord. It's during this time. He's going to sit on the earthly throne of David, David fulfilling 2 Samuel, 2 Shmuel, chapter 7. There are those who will rule and reign with him. So if you have shown yourself responsible, you've been faithful, he is going to tell you, I can use you, I need you to go to this area and rule over these people here. Put order into their lives. 
answer their questions, take care of their needs. I need you over there. He's going to have all kinds of jobs. Who knows what he's going to have? I signed up for giving tours of the land. Yeah. Join my tour, see Israel, Gary the Net, you saw it, but you've not seen it yet. <laughs> not the way we'll see it then. Let's join together and go together. I would have loved to have been with you. <laughs> so um, we're going to go into the sheep and goat judgment. That is for who goes into the kingdom. That's Matthew 25. We'll do that in just a few moments. Uh, we see or saw last week that this is the time of the construction of Hezekiel, Ezekiel's temple. This is not the temple that David, David built, obviously, that was in ruins, and then it was uh, rebuilt under Ezra and Nehemiah's time, and it was uh, refurbished heavily by Herod during Yeshua's time. That was destroyed in 70 AD. <clears throat> That's why when we talked about our Passover seders, we said if you use lamb, you're doing a prior 70 AD. If you don't have lamb on your Seder plate, you're doing it after 70 AD. Uh, either one is okay for showing the picture of what we're showing. And by the way, for the sake of the video, we'll do the whole Passover Seder, and you'll understand what that means next week. <laughs> okay, uh, but this temple is not even the third temple because we know during the tribulation there is a temple that has been rebuilt or built, whichever way you want to look at it, because in the middle of it, the Antichrist stops the sacrifices. The only place the sacrifices can be done is in Yerushalayim at the temple. That's it. can't be done anywhere else for, uh, according to the Word of God. So we know where it's taking place. We also know from many, many other references that we've been studying through the book of Revelation that took us to all kinds of other prophetic books that we're talking about the locale in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem. So that's a third temple that will be destroyed by the Antichrist putting his image to be worshipped. He's going to desecrate it. It's going to make it desolate in the middle of the tribulation time. So in essence, we're really talking about a fourth temple, if you want to just count and put it in order. This is the temple that we see from chapters 40 through 48 in the thick, in the thick Thank you. My English and my Hebrew together. <laughs> Ezekiel in English, Hezekiel in Hebrew. Okay, we see this one is filled with the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory of the Lord. It will be beautiful, it will be wonderful, and it will be huge, and all the nations are going to come up to it. We talked about that last week. Now, where I really rushed was to say that the center world government is also in Jerusalem at this time. Remember, right now, prior to this time, through the tribulation is the time of the Gentiles. We saw from Nebuchadnezzar's uh, um, image. We saw the head of gold. It was it was uh, Nebuchadnezzar at the time, Babylon. We saw the Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, revived from an empire. We saw how it goes down in quality. It was shown in two different ways. We're not going to go into all that now. That we're past that time. Now the time of the Gentiles has ended. That stone that was cut out without hands, representing virgin birth, representing our Messiah, has uh, landed on the toes of that statue and disintegrated it's gone and then the stone raised up and became a huge mountain in scripture symbolic of government of rule that's what we have that stone is ruling here the rock the rock hallelujah. of our salvation hallelujah so that's what we're looking at psalm to Helene, psalm 48 verse 1 says great is adonai greatly to be praised in the city of our god his holy mountain Beautiful in its elevation, the joy of the whole earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. I don't think I need to say more, but read on down, uh, verse 8 in particular, for the sake of the video and the quarters. Uh, look at Isaiah, Yeshia, chapter 65, verses 17 to 25. And Zephaniah 3, 16 and 17. Remember, we're showing that not just one is telling us we don't take something and just run with it because one person says it. We want to know that we're understanding and everything is in agreement. So right here you have David, Isaiah, and Zephaniah. You've got three prophets that are speaking, telling you the same thing. Okay, so that's why I give you that many references. Because we looked at some last week, I'm not taking time to do the whole thing this week. Now, worship will be centered in the temple also. 
They will come up to the temple. They will bring sacrifices, uh, the first fruits of the crops, etc. If there is also evidence that there will be the sacrificial system going on during this time, and it always raises a question with people, and I'm not sure that we do fully understand, but the closest that I can get for our understanding is the people that are living during the millennial, and we'll get into who they are in a moment, but as they continue on, they're going to give birth, and there's going to be new people on the scene coming along for a thousand years. This is a thousand year reign. Now, they will have no real understanding of the battle that you and I fight all the time of Satan and of, of Yeshua. Not that they're equal, because remember, he's not God's or the Lord Jesus's anti. You know, he's, he's not. But that battle that has gone on has been very costly for the souls. We know that because of his deceit and his lie, many are not accepting Yeshua Jesus for salvation. They also will not have a real understanding of the high cost of his life, I mean Yeshua's life, and then the blood that he shed, because they won't have anything to relate to it. They can live out the whole thousand years, no death, if they stay in line. The only ones that we're going to see that, that suffer death, suffer consequences so hard, are those who become outwardly rebellious. Believe me, like the countries that if you steal, your hand is chopped off, theft is very low in that country. You don't have everybody stealing from everybody else. They value their hands. So how can you teach a people to value when they don't have these things to understand? That when they see and understand from the sacrifice of this animal, and are taught that this is a picture looking back to what the Lord did, that he was the sacrifice lamb. I think it must be for that reason to be able to, for them to really understand and penetrate and realize there is a cost, that this is not, not something to be taken lightly. There is a reason why the Lord went to this degree. And so um, hopefully that helps you understand. Let me show you, I believe if I'm looking at the right verses, let's try Yeshia Isaiah 66 to see a little bit of uh, the Jewish... Um, Sacrifices, you know, and, and uh, offerings that are going to be given during the millennial time. Chapter 66 of Yeshaya, it's almost the very end of the book. We're going to go down to verse 20. And we read in verse 20. And they will bring all your kinsmen out of all the nations. Okay, this is bringing the Jewish people back. Um, let me see if I'm getting... Okay, it, it goes into it. I, Slightly. Uh, there's probably no other reference I've got down that's better, but we'll go ahead and read it. What it's saying is the Jewish people are going to be brought back from all over the world. We know we're scattered all over the world today. I don't care where you go, you can find Jewish people living there. So they're going to be being brought back from all the nations as an offering to the Lord. They're going to come all kinds of ways, on horses, chariots, wagons, on, on, on. But look at where they're coming. They're coming to my holy mountain, Jerusalem says Adonai. They're coming to Jerusalem just as the people of Israel themselves bring their offerings and clean vessels to the house of the Lord. Well now the Jews are going to come from all over. They're going to bring. But we're also going to see that the nations bring up. If they want rain in their country, they have got to come to the temple. They've got to come and worship. They've got to come bring their first fruits of their crops and all of that. Um, and, and verse 21 is talking about the the priesthood that will be in effect again, the Kohanim, that's the Kohans, and the Levitim, that's the Levites. They're going to be doing their jobs, their priestly jobs. Uh, I don't think we need to continue reading down here. Well, you'll see that they're keeping the Shabbat, verse 23, every month on Rosh Hodesh, that's the new moon, every week on Shabbat, that's every Friday night sundown to Saturday sundown. Everyone living will come to worship in my presence. Uh, and it goes on then what they'll be seeing from, uh, and again, that shows you how the view is not a perfect Garden of Eden because at first they're going to see the corpses of those who rebelled against him. That won't be continual once they're buried. They won't be seeing that. <coughs> but so you see from that the mix that, that is in there. Since it didn't hit exactly on what I wanted a whole lot, let's go to Ezekiel, Ezekiel. It's probably my better choice because it is the chapters that are on the temple. We're going to jump to 45. And we'll start with verse 18. 
Ezekiel 45 and verse 18. Adonai Elohim, the Lord God says this. On the first day of the first month, here you go, you're to take a young bull without defect and purify the sanctuary. The Kohen, the priest, will take some of the blood from the sin offering, put it on the door frames of the house, on the four corners of the altar sledge, on the supports of the gate of the inner courtyard. You are also to do this on the seventh day of the month for everyone who has sinned inadvertently or through ignorance. That's who will make atonement for the house. And you can go on and read on your own, but you see how they will be doing some of the sacrifices still, because the people still will sin. It won't be that they're sinning uh, because of Satan, but they're still born in human flesh. They're still going to have the sin nature within. They still have to be taught right and wrong. There's still going to be you know, that going on. They have the opportunity to do wrong. They have the opportunity to ask for forgiveness when they do wrong. So, it's, again, it's not that they're going to be puppets where God just says everything's perfect and you'll do this and you'll do that. They're going to have that free will still. That free will we're going to see expressed when we get just past the thousand years of what's called Gog and Magog. I don't know if we'll get to there today, but it's in our next chapter. We'll see what happens. I mean, it's in our same chapter, a few verses down. Yes. Does it mean then at that time that the whole world is just like one nation? Well, they talk about the nations coming up. So there'll still be an Egypt. Not all nations. There are some nations that God puts a full end to. But he does name that Egypt for 40 years, I think, is under judgment. And then they'll start to rebuild. Uh, so it does talk about different nations. But there will be a, a one world government, one world rule, which that's what the, our world wants today. But they don't want to put the Lord in charge. They want to put eventually and maybe sooner than eventually, the Antichrist is the one who's going to be in charge of that. So there still will be individual nations. Israel will still be seen as a nation, but it won't be the little slice. It will have its full property that, that, is not, that she's never experienced. So she'll have Iran, she'll have part of Iraq, she'll have Lebanon, she'll have part of Syria, uh, she'll have part of Egypt. So you're going to um, have like the Levant, the whole Levant would be hers? What is, what's the Levant? Of, uh, what you just um, said from the Egypt, Egypt on up? She, Israel will be, go look up Genesis 15, 18, and the borders that are given there that talk about that's what her territory will be. 15, 18, I believe. Let me make sure I'm right, that I'm not dyslexic. <laughs> It's either 15, 18, or 18, 15. You make me question. <laughs> no, no, no. If I told it wrong. Yeah, it, I was right. Genesis 15, 18. And I'll go ahead and read it for you. That day, Adonai, the Lord made a covenant with Avram. So we're in the time of Bereshit, which, by the way, might be Genesis. It might be my next book, I think. I'm still getting feedback, but I think. Okay. Uh, back in Avram's day. God made this covenant, said, this is the land I'm going to give you. And then he puts his name on that land. He puts his name on the city of Jerusalem. So when everybody says, what right does Israel have to it? Well, God said it. He said, this is the land I'm giving you, and I'm putting my name on it. So if you've got an argument, take it up with him. Okay? I have given this land to your descendants, those who are going to come from Avram. And we know that the Jewish race eventually comes out of the loins of Avram. From the body of Egypt to the great river, the body, the valley of Egypt, if I remember right. Anyway, to the great river, the Euphrates River. Some think that means from the Nile, and it could mean easily from the Nile. Others talk about the wadi being a little stream, I remember now. I tend to think it's probably more the Nile because the little stream was more unknown. But whichever is in Egypt, and it's going to go all the way to the Euphrates River. Euphrates River is Babylon's on Euphrates River. Babylon's in Iraq. So all that territory from Egypt all the way across to Iraq, and if I'm looking you know, for you all, I need to go in the other direction, um, that will all be her territory. The territory of, and then he names these seven countries, and he said, uh, these countries that follow, he said that he was going to thrust them out of the land when he brought Israel in because they were such a horrible people. Their sin was so great that he was going to put an end to them, that they were not going to continue on. That's why you don't have people that can tell you they're of the, the Kenny 
or the Kamizi, or the Kadmami. I've got the Hebrew here, I don't know them in English. Hitti, Hittites. Do you, anybody a Hittite today? <laughs> so all of these have been done away with. Not the termites yet, but the other ites. <laughs> okay. And again, God said, he said, I'm going to cast out seven nations, I'm going to give you this land, I'm going to put my name on it, you're going to worship me here. Well, if Israel stayed true to her God, we wouldn't have what, well, all we have now, but we know. It, and it starts even before Israel, because we have, out of our blessed forefather Avra, we've got two sons, Ishmael and Yitzhak, Isaac, the son of promise. And we know because of that, from that time all the way through, we have turmoil, we have sibling rivalry, we have fights, we have contention. So you, you can't even just blame it on the nation of Israel, it goes even further back, but you get my point. Yeah. Finally, they're going to come together though, because even those, and God promised, he promised blessing to the others. He said of Esau, when Esau and Yaakov, Jacob, were separating that, he was going to make a great, you know, make great nations come out of Esau also. And he has. But in this time, those nations will be under Israel as the head nation, and they'll come up in respect. We see a picture of that with Yosef when he was in, in uh, Egypt and had been raised to the throne. Remember his dream? He told his brothers and his parents, you're going to bow down to me. And even his dad said, you know, I got an issue with this. I'm going to bow down to you, my son. You know, that's not the respectful way. But God was foreshadowing what was going to happen. Yosef was raised up. His brothers and his father did bow down to him, as was said, but it was for their salvation. Mm -hmm. If Yosef hadn't been on the throne, they were down to 70, 75 people. When we have some of our meetings, we have more than that in one room. Can you imagine that's the whole entire race? Cousins, nieces, nephews, whatever, that's it. And they're in a famine. If they don't get help, they will die off. That's how close that it came to dying off. But God always keeps his remnant. And by the time he brings them out of Egypt, they're two and a half to three million strong. Okay, so back on track though, we see that they're doing some of, of the worship that we see recorded for the nation of Israel uh, in our original covenant in uh, the Torah, in the first five books. Some of that will be still reestablished, will continue on, at least during the millennium. After the millennium, We'll all find out together. <laughs> okay, uh, now with the, the worship going on, with Satan being underneath, we get all the way down to chapter uh, verse 7 of chapter 20, and that's the time that he'll be loose for a little bit. I'll explain what that means when we get to verse 7. Let me just say it's going to converge in a battle between Satan and our Lord Messiah. You know who wins. Amen. He's going to follow his line here and be cast into the lake of fire forever. Never to come back, never to haunt, never to lie, never to harm, never to hurt, never to poke his finger in the face of my God ever again. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> I can hardly wait till we can get there. So let's get his demise, okay? Let's get back into chapter 20 and verse 1. And I think I read the first part before, but I'm, because it's at least two classes ago, let's just remind ourselves. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. We saw that that angel, if we saw it before, and if we didn't, sometimes I forget because I study on both sides. Uh, if you didn't see it before, then let me bring out, this is utter humiliation. Satan, this great one, who is so powerful, who wanted to be equal to God, who was at one point put head. He was the, the cherished cherub originally. And it does not even take Michael, the archangel, to put him into the pit. Just a normal angel. Just anyone that God gave the assignment to. It, it's just a normal angel. Um, and he has to comply. He can't fight against it. Um, I saw my note. Let me take you to Ezekiel again. I should have told you to stay there. I don't remember why. I, oh, I think I do remember. And this is good to bring out. Let's look at it. Chapter 28. Somebody took it out of my Jewish Bible. 
Okay, there we go. Now, <laughs> okay, Ezekiel chapter 28, and we're going to look at verses 13 to 15 real quickly. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 13 to 15. Now, let me tell you, this is Satan way back. This is, we're going all the way back before Adam was created, okay? So before the creation of man, we are reading, and we are reading that, uh, well, if we look at verse 12, in the middle of 12, we can see you put the seal on perfection. You were full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Satan was beautiful. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now, remember the garden we're going to see, the garden... We know a certain location where we know because of the rivers where it was, but what I believe from this, I believe that the original name for earth was Eden, that the whole thing was the garden of God, okay? So, Satan's so in that garden. He's covered with all kinds of precious stones. I'm not going to try to read all those names. You can see it, but verse 14, you were a cherub protecting a large region. I don't like this version as well. Um, let me flip real quick to my new American because this one just it's a little weaker and I like I like the fullness. So pardon me for that. Ezekiel twenty eight and verse fourteen. Is it fourteen? Okay. Yeah, I can start with fourteen. You were the anointed cherub. Okay, anointed is is, you know, um, we know Messiah is anointed. Um, how can I say this? Uh, yeah, and it, it's it's a it's a high yeah is what I'm trying to say. When the when the king is anointed, he is being lifted up. So th this one was above other angels. That's what I'm trying to say. You are an anointed chair who covers. I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until and righteousness was found in you. Okay, that was a whole start. Satan had it great. He had the earth that, that, as we can know, as much as we can know, was like his kingdom. He was like the head of that kingdom. He had it wonderfully, but then we know that pride was found in him, and he wanted that position of God. He wanted not to be uh, under God. He wanted to be God. He wanted all the worship to come to him, and that's what's saying at that point, you know, you had been perfect, but now this was found in you. And where does it lead? It leads all the way to the point that we are going to come to where he finally is into the lake of fire. We'll go through his steps down in a moment. Um, I had in my notes here, maybe I should have just read it to make it clearer to you. Hebrew, the word Messiah, it means anointed. So when we call him Mashiach, Messiah, we are talking about um, and Christ is the, the from the Greek, you know, it's meaning the same thing. It's all meaning the anointed one. So again, he had a position that shows that, that he was over some. He had a good position. It wasn't that, that he didn't, that what happened, he lifted himself up in pride. Now let's look at our Messiah who was anointed. Let's look at what happened with him. Does he lift himself up? No. No. Go with me to Philippians chapter 2. And we see in Philippians chapter 2. And I think we'll start with about verse 5. I'll let you know as soon as I get there. But quite likely we're going to start with verse 5. Yeah. 5 is good because it puts it into perspective for us. Philippians 2. Okay. It's Paul writing to the community in Philippi. And he's telling them these are his baby believers. And he wants them to grow in the Lord. And he says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Messiah Yeshua. Okay, I want to put it where you'll understand it. The anointed one. Chapter 2, verse 5, now we're in verse 6. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God to be a thing grasped. That means that even though Yeshua was equal with God, he wasn't saying, this is who I am. Okay? God, a coward of me. But he emptied himself. He took on the form of a bondservant being made in the likeness of man. Now, can we grasp that? We're coming into the time of year that we talk a lot about Yeshua's death, burial, and resurrection. When you realize this is God, this is the one who created, this is the one who is perfect, 
who has around him everything. You know, he created it all. The angels are worshiping him. The, the, he's in the, the, the heavens. He's not living in a, a hut with a, a sin-soaked area. How do I say this? What I'm trying to get is the contrast from perfect and pure and beautiful and worthy of worship and honor, and that's what he's receiving, and rightfully so. He's going to come down and be a servant. He's not even going to come down and be a king on this earth. He's going to come down and be a servant. We're going to see that he is born in a stable. We're going to see that he doesn't have a place to lay his head. We're going to see that he doesn't go to the finest schools and he doesn't get the accolades of man. He is very much humbled and he chose to do that. This one who could have been lifted up and, and even said to mankind, you know what? I'm done with you. You guys aren't worth it. You're not worth the trouble. I'll just create something else. Let me just and start new. And all I'd have to do is speak it and be done. That this is what he did. The, the stark contrast to Satan, who's lifting up, saying, I want worship. I want to be the honored one. He's saying, let me come down to your level. Be confined into a body. He didn't even know that. He knew total freedom. He was everywhere. And he confined himself. One body, one place, one time. And then, in those humble conditions. And furthermore, and this is the totally mind-boggling. How many of you, when you were born, said, I've got a reason for being born. And my reason for being born is to die. Not one of us. In fact, look at the will to live that God has put in us. But he came to this earth for that purpose, to die. You cannot humble yourself more than that. That's just off the charts. Contemplate that from here until we get to Resurrection Day. Amazing. This is what it's saying. He was found in the appearance of man, and he humbled himself to that point, becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Now, it's not so much, although very true, that they're saying that's an agonizing death, but there's something more about that cross. He is going to come into the Jewish race. In his human form, he is going to be Jewish. That means he is under the law. Why is he doing that? Because it was the law that they were to conform to for their salvation. Not being able to keep the law, they had the sacrificial system put in place. <coughs> But in that law, it says, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Cursed is the one who hangs on a cross. He accepted fully the full curse of the law because he had to to redeem us from it. That's the curse we're under. The wages of sin being death. We are under that curse. And he was willing to humble himself to that point to come and even be cursed by the law, so to speak, because in that, his sinless blood could pay that penalty, take that curse, and then, in essence, bury it with him because he raises from it. Mm -hmm. He doesn't stay under it. He didn't just equal it. He Hallelujah. didn't just take care of the problem. Amen. He Amen. brought Amen. resurrection power, Amen. and he put it out on display and gave it to us freely on a silver platter. <laughs> silver in scripture speaks of redemption. Is that not perfect? <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> that is amazing. It was brought for another reason, but the Lord knew all about it today. <laughs> I love the way he works. <laughs> because it does bring it home to us, does it not? That is handling himself. He not only left heaven, he not only left perfection, he not only came to earth, he not only confined himself into a human body, he not only came as a serpent, he not only was willing to suffer and die, he not only was willing to take the curse, he did it all and he did it humbly. He did it willingly. The next time somebody says, well, the Jews killed Christ, throw in their face, 
he willingly laid down his life for those he called his friends, even when they weren't treating him as a friend. And whose sin killed him? All of ours. All of ours. No one could be left out. But wow. And what does God do? God it says, for this reason also, verse 9, God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So at the name of Yeshua Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Every tongue will confess Yeshua, Messiah, is Adonai, to the glory of Elohim, God. When I see and begin and know I don't comprehend what all he did for me, all I want to do is fall on my face before him. I want to bow on my knees. I want to look up and I want to say, thank you. Thank you. You are worthy of being exalted above all. And he is above all. Remember in chapter 5 when the tile deed to the earth was needing to be claimed and Yochanan's crying because there was no one found worthy. And he was still, don't cry. Don't cry. The lamb is the one who took it. He's the one who is worthy. And who is that lamb in chapter 5 also? The lion of the tribe of Judah. He is king. He is victory. He is victorious. He is everything. And we just stand in awe. I love that heaven's worshiping him. I love that when we're in that throne room and go back up there for a moment, hear the hallelujahs, hear the shouts of praise, Look at the four living creatures. Look at the 24 elders. Look at the people that go on before us. Look to the future, those who will be under the throne, because they accepted the fact that their life wasn't worth living if they had to deny him. And they denied all of them. They're all crying out. They're praising him. They're shouting hallelujahs. They're saying thank you. They're rejoicing. And in the midst of all of that, up come our praises, up come our prayers, right into the midst of it. We've got those 24 elders representing us now, but we get to bring our voice up there. Do you realize that? Your voice gets to go up into the heavens, gets to go up in the presence of the Lord. When you want to hug him, you can. <laughs> Maybe not tangibly right now, but you can. You can send that ahead. And I've told him many a time, I I just want to be head over heels in love with you. I want to throw my arms around you. I want to fall at your feet. I want to just sit there like a little puppy dog <coughs> and just. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> and, and I just begin to scratch the surface of what's in my heart. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. You're going to give me all the eternity to show that yes. to you and to do that. And that's where we're going. Yes, He's lifted up. He is resurrected. He is alive forever. You sure did a good puppy. <laughs> Therefore, does my father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. Amen. Give us a scripture reference. It's uh, John, St. Mm -hmm. John 10, 17, 18. Okay, John 10, 17, 18. Yochanan, same one who wrote our book of Revelation, and she just summed up everything that I'd said. Mm -hmm. And I take that moment because I want us to glory in his glory. I want you to feel, I want you to realize the next time you're battle weary, remember, he knows battle weary. He knows suffering, but he didn't stay down. 
He didn't stay dead. He rose again. Hallelujah. Wait till you get to it in the Passover. Ooh, we, we got fun coming. Did you bring them how beautiful you said we kiss his feet. And, and, oh, and I see those nail yes. pierced feet. Yes. Nail pierced. We're going to see the nail prints to remind us through all of eternity the great cost of our salvation, the great love. And you know what? He did it just for me. And he did it just for you. Isn't that? Amazing. What a Whoa. mastermind of a plan. Yeah. He knew, he planned, he did it all. He doesn't leave one bit to us. All we do is freely accept the gift. Mm -hmm. wow. I shall I have this piece at the tip of my tongue. Uh, the friends we went to visit in, in um, uh, Arizona. The question brought to me was what would happen to the people that the past before Jesus came? And I, I, my, my answer was, if you were Jewish and you didn't, you're, you don't have a second chance. And if you're Gentile, the same thing, correct? You're right, Jewish and Gentile did not matter. They couldn't understand that. And I said, I know my, my Jewish teacher says that. <laughs> <laughs> but remember, you don't say that. <laughs> you say it because it's it the word of God. <laughs> my Jewish teacher said that, and she went into the Word of God. Thank you, thank you. And here's the references that back it up because and if I you can, her, yes, she, yes. she shows us yes. in the scripture. That I said, I'm sorry, I have to tell you that. But right. That's what it, what this, says. this is what it all focuses around is yeah. the cross. And yes, you're right. You have to say it because it's what the scripture says. It's yes. what the Word of God says. Yes. They looked to the cross. Now, God gave to the Jewish nation the responsibility of being the priest to the world. Take the message to the world. In that, he gave them the law that showed the world that they can't rise up to God's standard. That here is his plan of redemption. Because all the way back from Adam, when Adam and Eve pulled their boo-boo. <laughs> When they sinned, I'll, I'll, put it, I'll put it bluntly, when they sinned, he did not condemn them. People have asked, is Adam in heaven? Well, <laughs> you think when God had that blood sacrifice made for him, that that didn't cover his sin the same as it covered all of our sins? That it was the picture right then of what was going to come, the Lamb of God who was perfect, who would shed sinless blood? Of course, of course. And by the fact that we see that he taught his sons to make the sacrifice, one chose to do right, one chose to do wrong, but it shows Adam was passing it on to his, his children. So I'm sure he was under the blood, so to speak. But the Jewish law during this time, when we get in the law, if you were Gentile, you came in under that law. You proselyted. You came in said, I believe in the one true and living God. Remember when they came into uh, the promised land? Jericho is one of the first, in fact, it was the first city. And when they took it and the walls fell down and it crushed the, the enemy, but do you remember who was spared? Yeah. Rahab in your English, Rahab in your Hebrew. She was a harlot. That's not a woman living a perfect, pure, clean life, a good, respectable person. But she knew, she had heard of the, the God of this people. You see, his reputation even went before him. And the same way Abraham knew and said, I want to cross over from worshiping idols to worshiping the one true and living God. All through time, from creation all the way through, there's only been one true and living God. Amen. All the rest are false. All the rest are not alive. All the rest, if they were a person alive at a time like Muhammad, he's dead. Excuse me, people? He's dead. And when they worship his God, who is all of they're worshiping all of means the moon God, and they're worshiping the moon, and they're worshiping Satan, who is teaching them to worship something other than the one true. God. But that's why Israel had what the nations needed. They were given the oracles of God. They were given the, the message. They were to take it out. The Gentiles were to come into it. It was a way of order. It was a way for it to be taught. And God said, by the way, I'm going to choose the Jewish people because they're the least. They're the front. They're the ones you're going to look at and say, huh, them? Good, because
is when you're not looking to them, then you'll be looking to me. You'll be looking to the God who is doing it. The Jewish people aren't going to rescue you. The Jewish people aren't saving you. I am saving you. So the whole point, the focus was to look at the Lord and to realize one true and living God, and this is his plan. And in that law, he gave the beauty of the looking to the cross. Once the cross had come, now salvation was purchased for all time. All time. Go ahead. Okay. There was a challenge, and they were saying that, okay, I believe, we all believe that Abraham was saved through his faith. In faith, he was saved. So was Adam. But this one person is uh, claiming that he wasn't saved until Jesus died and took him all of the living believer's soul Okay, what they're saying what they're saying is that they're not saved until they're home in heaven. I'm going to say that you receive what is already yours when you get home to heaven. They would not have gone into the paradise side in the heart of the earth if they were not saved. And when we leave this earth, it's still. Yeah, so he, they already had salvation, but they had to wait for the Messiah. Yes, why did they go into the heart of the earth? We're getting off, and I think it's important. Yeah, it is important. Why did they go into the heart of the earth and not into God's heaven? It's because there is the mercy seat in heaven. What was on earth was patterned after the heavenly. That mercy seat is where the Lord Yeshua Jesus applied his own blood. Where do we get this in scripture real quickly when you see that he raised from the dead and he's seen by Mary in the garden and he told her, don't cling to me, I've not yet gone to my father. Mm -hmm. A little later we read where the women were able to cling to him. Mm -hmm. Obviously he had slipped off of earth into heaven. He put his blood on the mercy seat in heaven and he came back down to earth. We're not recorded that. Nobody saw that. We know it because we put these verses together and we see once he did that bless you once he did that now heaven is ready to receive all who are coming in because see the blood of bulls and goats could only cover the sin it couldn't wash it away so even though they died in their faith believing proven by doing the sacrifices they still had their sins only covered I kind of look at it like when you're cleaning house. If we sweep it under the rug, you don't see it, but it's still there. And it'd be a problem in time. If sin ever enters into heaven, it would corrupt heaven. So it couldn't enter in. So they waited in a paradise side in the heart of the earth until that blood was put on the mercy seat in heaven. And that's why you have, at the time of Yeshua's death here on this earth, we have some of the graves open. And some of the people, after he raised from the dead, came out from the graves and were among those who were living there. We know that showed to the world resurrection. It was another proof. But we also read in Ephesians 4 that Yeshua took captivity captive and that he took it through... Um, let me read it for you because um, I can't say it right. It's, you have to understand what it, it's saying. But we know that there was a time that he took... And I believe it's when he emptied Sha'ol paradise, not the suffering side, but the paradise side, when he took it from the heart of the earth into heaven, because now his blood had been up there. We are looking at um, Ephesians 4. 4, yes, 4 verse 8, okay? Um, wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, okay, when the Lord ascended up on high, Ephesians 4 verse 8. He led, and in my English here, it says he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, when he led captivity captive, when uh, the victors won and they come back home, they're leading captivity captive. They're leading who they've got, who's their booty. They're leading through the, the town, showing to everyone, this is mine. In essence, when the Lord had procured that salvation 
the sins were now washed away for all those who had died in faith believing that's his booty mm -hmm. he's got them now and he took them and he went right through satan's territory remember he's the prince of the power of the air he went right through that territory and showed on display these are mine and he took them safely into heaven right into heaven okay when you have moshe um, and Elijah, Eliyahu, when you have them standing on the Mount of Transfiguration with Yeshua, remember they came down out of heaven. They didn't come up from the heart of the earth. They came down. You know what? I got I got I got to work on that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, because that was prior to the cross. Yes. So, so I'm going to say that it was shown to them in that way because this is what would be. Okay, but I'm going to have to stand corrected there because it was not that they already were in heaven. Okay, interesting, but we see, and we know that, that we're told, and this one I can stand on, we're told that we saw, the ones who saw the Lord ascend up into heaven, that he would return in that same manner, he would take us up into heaven to be with him. We know heaven is up, we know the Lord is at the right hand of the Father today. So, forgive my one, let's take that part out so I don't confuse you, but here in verse uh, 8, he's led captivity captive, and then the gifts that he gave to men, I believe, is looking for yes to the, the giving of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit to impart into believers the gifts that he's given all of us that we use in service to him today. Hallelujah. So Sean, what I said was correct in, in the sense that I mean before Jesus came the people that accepted the Lord that, that, that knew that they, they praised they God believed. and they believed in God. They believed this day they, was coming. They will be in heaven. Now the people that died and did not they don't get a second chance. No. And that was the thing that no. they were asking and I okay. said no. God's yeah. word says it, that okay. your yes should be yes and your no should be no. It, you know in other words uh, I'll take you to another verse to back that up. Hold on one second. Let me finish this thought, but don't let me forget to get that. Verse 9, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? That's when the Lord went down into Sheol. Yeah. He that descended is the same one who ascended up far above all the heavens that he might fill all things, complete all things. Okay, so it shows he went down first. He went down in the heart of the earth. Then he brought the heart of the earth up with him into heaven. Now... He may or may not have emptied out all of Sheol. There are two different views on that when we get into the three phases of the first resurrection. We know at least a first fruit, at least some, were raised that were taken. Okay, we'll find out later whether it's all or not. But not to get confused on that, let's follow forward. You're asking, what about the people who died without faith believing? It's represented by this dark line all the way through. They only come up to stand before God at the great white throne judgment, where they're judged on the basis of their works, so that the consequences of their suffering will be based on someone like Hitler getting a worse punishment than someone like the little neighbor down the street who never harmed a flea. Okay? Justice and fairness. Okay? But they are never given a second chance. Why do we know that? Because Hebrews. Hebrews 10, Hebrews 9 first. Let me go to 9, 27. And then I'm going to go to 10. I think it's 28 that we'll start with. But 9, 27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. When you die, then you're going to go before a judgment. One way or another, believers do not go to a judgment for salvation they already have salvation believers as we're saying right now go right into heaven they're not stopped at the gate and said do you have a pass you know what how do you get in here they get in because of the blood that has been shed for them they come through that shed blood into the presence of the lord and one day we'll stand at the judgment seat the bema seat for reward remember they're already in heaven they're not being judged whether they get to go into heaven or not they're just getting their rewards, the robe of righteousness, like Amen. my mom would say, some may have short little skirts, and some may have flowing robes, <laughs> some may have a lot of crowns, and some may have a little, some may have shiny baubles in the crowns. We know there are many crowns. You can get a martyr's crown if you're martyred. Now, not all of us want to wish for that one, do we? But, you know, there's crowns for leading people to the Lord, or jewels, you know. So we stand before the Lord only for that. Never does the Lord bring out uh, our life and show us the laundry list. You did this wrong. You did this wrong. You did this wrong. No, the unsaved, they're the ones that will face that kind. But all that's going to be touted out to be looked at is 
what we did for the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now we might say, well, what happened to I did this one and I did this? And the Lord says, well, you know, <laughs> you did that in your own strength, your own power, and you were full of yourself there. So I'm not going to reward you for that. But this over here where you were my instrument, this is your blessing. So judgment seat for rewards or lack of rewards from that, God will say, this one's faithful, I'm going to put them over. Okay, give me a big area. I'll, I'll make it real general. This one's going to be like a president over the United States, and I don't mean that position literally. But another one who was faithful, but not in as big of a capacity, maybe they'll be the governor of California. You know what I'm saying? There'll be different positions, different ranks, different responsibilities. Those who have shown themselves greater in responsibility will receive greater places to rule. Those who aren't worthy of rule will not rule during that time. You'll see. You'll see. <laughs> I'm not going to touch that. Okay, but your faith sealed. Amen. Hebrews 9.27 is sealed. And it didn't matter. It didn't say here if you're Jewish or if you're Gentile. It said man. Mankind, that means women too. We're not left out of that. Mm -hmm. That is where it's at. The Jewish people had the way taught to them through the sacrificial system to show it to the world, to share it with the world. They were to present it to the world. It wasn't that they had it in. The Jews don't get in just because they're Jewish. They're not left out because they're Jewish. Gentiles don't get in because they're Jew Gentile and they're not left out because they're Gentile. Now, go with me to Hebrews 10. Um, 28 do I want? No. no, no, no. Um, well, we get down to 31. I'm just trying to see how far I need to back up. Maybe 30 will be enough. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongs to me. I will, and this is recompense, I will repay, says the Lord. Okay, the Lord is the judge. He's going to judge what should be avenged. He's going to judge right. And it says following, and again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Okay, that is judgment. We are, we, everyone faces that judgment who has denied the Lord. They're going to stay in their, uh, in, in the, in their holding tank. Because they're not in the lake of fire yet. That's where they eventually will be. They'll come up, be judged, and be cast into the lake of fire also. Okay, Sherry? The so, okay. question that always comes up is, what about the people that never heard about the gospel? Okay, easy. And I know everybody wants to trip on that? No. God has put into everyone a spark that, that, that's of faith, you know, that can embrace faith and accept faith. No one comes to the Lord except he's drawn them, okay? Now, he's put that into a man wherever man is living. Now, in man's circumstances, in the jungles, they can see the beauty of creation. Even that alone begins to draw their mind to, there's a master <laughs> creator. Remember the story I told you, the one that it was their job, the family job, to make the idols. And he's carving that idol one day, thinking, if my hand can carve this idol, it, my hand's better than this idol. I made this idol. Who made my hand? God had put in him that curiosity and drew him. And because he wanted to know, God saw to it that he got more light. His light came from walking through another tribe, um, jungle area, that had the missionaries there that were giving the gospel that day. And he heard, as he was passing through on the way to market, he heard. And he thought, wow, that's, that's who I've been wondering about. And he embraced the community and took it back home to his village. Modern day story, the, the filming of the, the Jesus film that they take into third world countries, they take generators and sheets and go out where there's nothing, nowhere. They were out, in, and they often are out in like dark desert areas. <coughs> and it, the turnout is huge. They had the film going. They had the big sheep. They had the film going. They had hundreds of people down here. Up on this mountain precipice is where the train goes through. That train just happened to break down and sit there the whole length of time that this film dealt with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. Now, how many people on that train heard for the first time and got saved? 
Oh, oh my God, no. That I don't believe that train sat there by accident. Oh, and there's story after story after story like that. The chief that's being witnessed to by the missionary who said, if I could see a nail, maybe I could understand, maybe I could believe. And the missionary went back to his hat that night and said, Lord God, how am I ever going to get this across to him? He had brought supplies with him for himself, for his food, for his sustenance. He opens a can that night for dinner. He pours the can out into his pot to put it on the fire, and he hears, clink, soup, clink. <laughs> he looks in there, there's a nail in his can of soup for dinner on the very night of the day that the chief had said, if I could just see a nail, I can maybe believe. And we know FDA standards. How could a nail get a can? And that can open that day. That's my God. That's how he's answering all the needs out there. Anyone who is willing, he's not willing that any would perish. If he has to send them an angel, give it to them in a vision, in a dream, he does that. Or our scriptures are full of prophetic dreams and visions. Many times in these third world countries, what we're hearing today, yeah. one king in who was coming with Bibles in his car and to start setting up to do the work for the Jesus film. And he comes into to this, and when I call the town, it's next to nothing. But here was this man, he comes running up to the car and he says, are you the man? Are you the man? You must be the man. And he, he looked at me and he says, what man? He says, the angel told me in a dream, a man was coming, he'd have a book for us, they'd tell us everything we need to know. Are you the man? His trunk was full of Bibles in the language of those people. Yes, I'm the man. I hear this time and time and time again. God is not going to allow anyone, just because of where they were born, to not hear and not get saved. If he left heaven to come down to earth to die, you don't think he'd put an angel right there and say, here's the story? Oh, or maybe a person, Philip who is not near the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch is studying the book of Isaiah. I can't figure this out. I am so confused. I don't know what to do. <laughs> do you need some help understanding? <laughs> he teaches it to him. He accepts it. He baptizes him. And psh, Philip's gone. Where'd he go? To his next assignment. The God needs to drop Philip out of heaven. He'll do it. And not literally Philip said, I mean, he'll do it. So that's my answer, that, that God gives them an innate sense of a creator. He gives them an ability to believe, that spark of faith, and then he fulfills whatever is necessary because he did it all. So it's not on anyone's part. Now, we are told that he won't come in second coming where it comes all the way down to the earth in second coming until the gospel's gone out to the ends of the earth. And we know that we're working on that. But that doesn't hold back our timing of rapture. That's just um, the 144,000, the two witnesses, the eagle or angel, whichever it is, flying through the heaven with the gospel, all of that will also be seen to it that it gets to the ends of the earth. But now i got to tell you, too, we need to carry the burden. We need to be active. We need to be busy. When my... Uh, cousin went in a youth mission at age 14, went into um, Thailand, went to an area where they have not heard before. An 80-year-old woman accepted the Lord, tears pouring down her face. The next day, she's hungry, she's getting them to feed her spiritually, but the next day she says, how long have you known? How long have you known? And the kids didn't even know how to answer, but they just said, you know, long, long time, and she said, why didn't somebody come and tell my mother? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the heartbreaking thing. We need to go. We need to get the word out that would her mother have come to save her faith? And her mother was met in some way, given that opportunity. God is not willing that any should perish. Doesn't matter where you're born, doesn't matter your position. God cuts through everything, every layer. Just like my, my cousin that doesn't believe in God. You know, I had never experienced Sherry. But somebody that doesn't believe in it is heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. And it's right here in our country, too. My brother has, uh, in his line of business, that brought one of his mechanics to the house on a Sunday after taking him to a church service. And as they're talking in, in 
his garage, his hangout place, he's realizing this young man, probably around 20, knows nothing. And as he started to talk with him, he, he realized, he said, if I said to you Paul Bunyan, or I said to you Jesus, you know more about Paul Bunyan than you know about Jesus. You know, he knew nothing. He grew up in America, grew up in an area saturated with churches on many corners that he'd never heard that God put my brother into his life at that time, put you into your cousin's life. You planted a seed. You prayed for it to be watered. God will give that increase. The real Kakodish, the Holy Spirit, can reveal the truth to anyone, anywhere. In a coma, in a jungle, in a palace, in a pit. And if they're under the age of believing, they're already under the blood. They're not held responsible. God does not say that a one that was too young to understand right and wrong and choose, he would not condemn. Okay, and we know that from David. When David's child died, David put off his morning clothes and cleaned up and wanted food. And they're like, why are you doing that now? You should be mourning now. And he says, no, the decision's been made. My son can't come back to me, but I can go to my son. Amen. I want to say even a godly youth, uh, somebody in a dream, uh, Copeland was saying, there was a man in his church that had a dream. God transferred him to Africa, way deep in the jungle. And he was standing there, and he couldn't figure out why I'm here. And a young man in that village ran up to him and said, you came for me. And he led him to Christ. And all of a sudden, the witch doctor, whoever said that village, turned around, and they chased him out, and then he vanished. God can use anybody. He can and he will. He will. His hand's not cut short, but I cannot say. You know, when I, when I went to uh, Cuba, to uh, uh, we, we did the we mission over there, there was this lady that I went into her house, and she says, I have been waiting for you. Because I had a dream that someone was coming to give me something. <laughs> and it was when yeah. you were coming, I said, oh my God. Yes. You know, what a privilege. Oh, it I is. had it is. to really, and, and they yes. did accept it. The Lord, it was her and, and two others. Praise the Lord. It was, Praise it was just amazing. Yeah. And she, she reminds me of my mom with um, our tours to Israel. We've done tours many times. And my dad especially was the evangelist. <coughs> my mom was the teacher. Uh, you are, have to be careful how you share in Israel, but they both, you know, were doing what they could, but you're also on a tour. Um, my dad would give out, you know, his, his testimonies. Um, he had the Hebrew language, so he could talk and schmooze, and, you know. So my mom had her Bible class, which we are the, the um, progeny. We are, yeah, Patty was in my mom's class. Who else was in my mom, sat under my mom? Miriam. Right, uh, you know, some are still around. My mom's in heaven for Satan, those who need to know. But she came under such a burden to pray that we would lead one Israeli to the Lord on this tour. And she even thought for mine, you know, Mike will probably do it. My husband will probably do it. It didn't matter who. She just felt burdened and asked Bible class, pray with me, join with me. We want to see the fruit of these tours in the salvation of one, at least one. And the very first day, we go into a shop, a long story short, it's a little shop off of the, the main drag. We went because someone saw on the main drag what they needed to get for a friend and it said it was in that shop. So she, there were several of us together, we went into that shop, the proprietor's there, and we saw something else in the shop that would make us, uh, we don't want to carry it all around that we needed, we promised to bring it back for someone. So my mom asked him, will you be open when we come back that it'll be on Saturday, it'll be on Shabbat. He says, oh yeah, I'll be open. And she says, oh, then you're not religious. Or, or you're not a believer. I forget what she said. But anyway, he says he wasn't so religious. But this started the conversation. Now, the thing you need to know is just before this started, when we walked into that shop, a woman who was working behind the counter picked up her purse, said something in Hebrew to the man, and walked out. We find out later that was his wife. And that's important also, God's timing. She walked out. We're in this shop this whole time this happens. Not one other person came in outside of our little group and shopped. Not one. Two other people went outside the shop, stood outside the shop praying because they heard what was going on. Several of us stayed in and were praying in our hearts. And my mom starts talking with him. And he says, let me tell you something. 
I had a dream, and I don't know what it means. He said, but in this dream, I was in the middle, and there was an angel on one side, and then God was on the other, and, and he said, come up, and we were going up, and he says, I don't know what that means. And my mom said, I think God sent us to tell you what the dream means. And she shared with him how we will go up in rapture one day into the presence of the Lord. And he was selling in his shop all of wood Bibles. So he had a new covenant where we could show and tell about the rapture where it talks about us being called up. And so she went and opened it up to him. He could read it in his Hebrew. There was an English there also. And she was able to take him through that and say, God was showing you. But what you have to do to be ready to go up. And she gave him the gospel. Just laid it out very simply. And then asked him, have you ever asked the Messiah, Yeshua Jesus, to be your Savior? And he said, no. Would you like to now? And she was sure. He'd say, oh, I'll think about it, or I'll do it tonight, or you know, I'll talk it over with my wife. He says, why not? <laughs> <laughs> and so she asked him, would he like to pray? And he asked her, would you help me? And she led him in a prayer. And he opened his heart right there. And later he told us he'd never shared that dream, not even with his wife. If she hadn't left, he wouldn't have felt free. Mm -hmm. We had the joy. We marked places in that new covenant for him to start reading and to grow. And we also knew that we were going to plug him in with, with other believers, you know, so that there could be follow-up. And we did get to go back and see him one time later on another trip, and he his profession was still there. We met a friend of ours another time, too, with profession still there. So we knew it was genuine. But um, when we, when it was all done, we finally had to get to the point where we just left. I mean, we had all, you know, um, one of our people with us was a little um, elderly Dutch grandmother, and she said, if you were my son, I'd give you a hug. And she said, I'm going to hug you anyway. <laughs> and all of us, you know, we're just hugging, embracing. The spirit was witnessing. There was such excitement. There was such joy on his face. It looked like the weight of the world had come off of him. And he was just, you know, enthralled with it all. We finally said our goodbyes, and, and we were headed back. And the one who we'd gone in for, who was buying something for somebody else, she says, I can't give this away. This let us, oh, and by the way, his name was Maurice Mosseltoff. Congratulations. <laughs> what a name. She says, I can't give this away. This is what led us to Maurice. I gotta go back and get another one for my friend, I gotta keep this one. So we all traipsed back. And when we came back, you know, we, my mom said to him, she says, see, we couldn't leave. And he says, I know, it's that feeling. You know, he was already attesting and feeling the connection. Well, we were in there to purchase that other, um, it was one of those spoons, collector spoons. Do you know that shop was full of customers? It was busy, everything was going on. But the time we were there, God kept everybody else out, gave us that time led him to the Lord. We left him on that last day. He was not there when we went back. We had brought my dad to meet him. We were so disappointed that we left him a, a full Bible. We left him other literature to help him. We left him our, our, a note and our address, and he sent us a postcard, and he signed it, Your Brother in Messiah. Oh, wow. Wow. He's in heaven, or will be, you know, I don't know. I'm thinking from age he's probably in heaven, but thank you, Lord. He burdened my mom to pray that way. The Bible class had the joy of being part of that. And that's why I tell you, when you pray for others, you're part of your salvation. You'll reap in that reward. You'll be blessed also. Jewish, Gentile, doesn't matter. God died. Well, Yeshua, Jesus, died for all. And he's not willing that one perish. So any who will come to him, he will not stop at anything short <coughs> So we've gotten sidetracked. I hope it's been a blessing. I want to get us a little bit further, okay, because I want to get us our complete thought. What I'm not going to go into now, but uh, let me just say in general, and if it peaks, either wait for Genesis when I teach it or come see me later, but it is believed that this was the, the kingdom of Lucifer, and in his fall, this also was judged. This birth was judged. That's why you have Genesis 1-2 that the earth was without form and void. 
because when God created it, it was not created that way. We get that from Isaiah. Isaiah tells us it was not created with um, form and void. And think about it. If God speaks and it comes into existence, how could it come into existence in a partial form, in a chaotic form? You know, even just that alone should be enough to suffice. But there's more from the Hebrew that I'll share with you yes. on that. Yes. But the point being, Lucifer raised himself up and lost his kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yeshua humbled himself, and God raises him up with the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So total, the total opposite, total, I mean, wow, what a difference, okay? But this one now, who has been our adversary? This one, this angel, just the normal, everyday angel. I went back to chapter 20 um, and verse 1. I think I'm ready for verse 2. But I've got to get back to myself. Chapter 20. Okay. And it's going to do that same malfunction. Let's see. Oh, okay. Maybe I got, I got it. It came in. Okay, so... The angel came down from heaven. He's holding the key of the abyss. That's what I wanted to bring down to bring to you. First of all, Satan is down on earth at this time. He's not in heaven. Remember, he's been cast out of heaven. Finally, he had he was able to go into heaven. We know from Job, Job, and from others, we see he go persecute. No, not persecute. Excuse me. Condemn. You know, us before God and the Lord steps in as interceder for us. But we know he had that right. But finally we see in the battle in chapter 12, we see that he was cast down to earth. Here we know he was still working on earth all the way through the tribulation time, entered into the Antichrist. But remember when I brought to you the Antichrist's fate? The Antichrist was at the point of the return of the Lord when the Lord the, the sword out of his mouth annihilates the enemies of Israel, and he, um, he's, how do I say it? I don't want to say annihilate in the sense, poof, he's gone, but the Antichrist's life ceased, and he was given a fast ticket to the lake of fire. Yeah. He was not given time to come to the great white throne and be judged for his actions. I believe that they are so bad, so evil, that God says, you don't even, there's nothing to stand for. Yeah, you don't, exactly. You don't even deserve the judgment. You're just headed for the consequences because I believe the Antichrist, Satan, and a uh, false prophet, his false trinity, will receive the greatest degree of punishment that there can be. And without excuse, there's nothing, no good that they could stand before him at this great white throne and receive any kind of mercy. So they were cast immediately into the lake of fire. We're going to see that that will be where Satan finally ends up also. But he doesn't at this time because God still has something that he is going to be involved in. God knows the plan. God allows it. We'll explain why at the time. But because of that, he's just put into the abyss where he cannot harm during the thousand years. Okay, so um, the key, when it says that, he, that this angel has a key, the key is a symbol of power or a symbol of authority. So it's showing this angel has power and authority over Satan. Um, the key is given to the bottomless pit. Remember in, in Revelation chapter 9, the spirits, the evil spirits that came up out of the pit, out of the abyss. We know also from verses like uh, Jude 6 that under the waters there's an area where the, the demons are confined, waiting <coughs> their judgment. Uh, they're so bad that the Lord doesn't even let them loose. Our demons that we know work today because we know Satan can't be everywhere. If he's troubling somebody over here, he's got a cohort troubling somebody over there. He's not like the Lord where he can be everywhere at once. He's not hearing all of us at once. He's not able to act on in that capacity he is not the opposite of, of our messiah of our savior so he just has a wonderful i know i'm not going to use that word a horrible team that works with him and he i'm sure has the same way god has archangels and angels i'm sure that he has arch demons and regular demons and those that, that he needs to send the sharper, harder ones to, he does. Those who are the easier to trip up, he sends the others. But he's got a whole network, a whole team working for him. Remember, he's prince of the powers of the air. Prince says he's over somebody. He's over something. He talks about kingdoms that he has. God's always had order. What does Satan do? Counterfeit it. So all of this, um, I believe, because Satan is their head when he is 
in prison in that bottomless pit during this time, I believe that his cohorts are not able to work freely either because we do not read during the millennial time of that kind of effect yeah. on the people. They are going to live in an environment with the king sitting on the throne that is peaceful, that there's not going to be war, there's not going to be the, the deceiver, there's not going to be this kind of trickery going on. So when they come to this point where they're going to have to show what's in their heart, that's when we're really going to find out. That's what we'll go into. But it will not be because Satan deceived them. It will be because they have a rebellious heart of themselves. Remember the people born, and we're not going to get into it today, unfortunately, but the people that are born are going to be born in the flesh. They're still going to have their, their humanness. They can live out the whole time as long as they stay right before the Lord. So a child will die at a hundred. An old man will die at a thousand is, is how the scripture says in Isaiah. We'll go into that next week. I'm just trying to give you a little bit since I said it was coming. But this um, bottomless pit, this prison house of the, the demons, obviously the key shows it is locked. In essence, that's showing me that it's open for Satan to go into it and be locked in there in some form, in some way. We'll look at the chain in a moment. But it is he and his cohorts in my mind, you know, because the others are not going to be let out either. And they're not going to have their head telling what to do and where to go and how to do it. So the millennial will be an easier time in that sense. But they still are not puppets. They're still free will human beings. And we'll look at what happens with them at the end of time after we've gotten what happens. We've got to get them into the millennium to get them out of the millennium. So we'll come to that. Um, it's called the deep. When you look at uh, Luke chapter 8, 31, if you read about the pit there, it's called the deep there. Again, under the waters, in the depth, wherever this is, if that's <coughs> literal or symbolic, I won't say. I tend to think there could be a, a real literalness to it because we know the depths of the waters that we cannot measure it. We know that the darkness that is there, and we know that human uh, ability to live is not there. So it could be that God has shored up, um, or closed up, I should say, the, the demons in that. That's like their holding tank. Remember? Yes, yes. And remember in Luke 8, I should have said also, that's where the demons were being cast out of the person, and they, they said, don't send us back to the abyss. Don't yeah. send us back to the pit. Because they knew in the pit they can't come out. They'd be stuck. They wanted to be able to go, you know, still do their work. So God allowed for them to go into the pits. The unclean animals shows you it was the area where the Gentiles had their their um, yeah. their livelihood. But anyway, where do those pigs go? Yeah. Right to the ocean. Right to their death. Right to the pit. Okay. So God is His way. Somebody called that devil town. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, they, it does mention. Did I just read? It? <laughs> We're not gonna have devil for a while. <laughs> if ever, right? If ever, yeah. Um, a great chain was in his hand. Okay, let me show you real quickly. If this is literal, look at Mark chapter five. We're gonna just look at a couple things to tie up this verse here. Mark chapter 5, we're going to see what it, um, and it's the same word, that's why I'm taking you to it, it's the same Greek word. Mark chapter 5 verse 3 talks about this, um, this man had an unclean spirit, he, he lived in the caves, the arrow caves, he couldn't contain himself, he couldn't live a normal life. Verse 3 says he lived in the burial caves and no one could keep him tied up, not even with a chain. Yeah, so yeah, that sounds like a literal chain, okay? It could be that we take it literally. How do you chain a spirit? I don't know. But those spirits are confined right now in the, the bottomless pit. We know that. So adding Satan there is not a problem for the Lord. Whether it is, you know, maybe there is some sort of form that is chained. You know, it's not just spirit form is so, but we, you know, I can't tell you. I'm just showing you the possibility because it's the same word in the Greek. Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12 and verse 7, we read that there, suddenly an angel of Adonai stood there and a light shone in the cell. He tapped on Keith's side. You know this story? Yeah. Peter is in prison. 
He's awaiting his judgment and what will probably be his death sentence. And he's so worried. He's so fearful. <laughs> the angel had to wake him up, but he still, because he was such a threat to society, he had been chained. He had not just been put in the prison, he had been chained. He was chained between guards. There were guards right there with him, there were guards outside of his cell, and there were guards outside of the prison. All of this to keep this one terrible prisoner you know, from, from being able to escape. Well, is that anything too hard for our Lord? No. And when the angel touched him, we read here, um, he tapped okay. the side, well, come up, hurry, get up, he said, and the chains fell off his hands. And we know... The angel let him all the way out. Once he was out free, then the angel disappeared. Once again, when we ask, how can salvation go? That angel got into the middle of the prison, got chains off of two guards who will lose their lives for losing their prisoner. I don't think they were sleeping on duty. <laughs> and they're going, oh, I just thought of another story today. I have to do another time. Another exciting story of the Lord. Acts 28 and verse 20. Uh, real quickly, but again, that, that was a literal chain that was chaining Kepha, chaining Peter. Mm -hmm. Chapter 20, verse 20 says, This is why I've asked to see you and speak with you, for it is because the hope of Israel that I have this chain around me. This is Shaol Paul talking. He again is in prison. He's been in prison for being a witness for his testimony for the Lord. And he is saying, I've got this chain around me. For Israel, I'm here because I cared enough about Israel, a witness to Israel, even at the peril of my own body being chained and possibly facing. That one is Acts 28 and verse 20. You'll have to read before to get the whole context. But that's Acts 28, 20. The last one I'll show you, go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6. And we read... 16. Thank you. I was going to say six is the wrong verse. <laughs> Thank you, Loretta. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. And this should be at the end of your cross-references where it shows verse 1. I think you're on page 73 now. Okay. Chapter uh, 1 of Second Timothy, verse 16. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesphorus, because he was a comfort to me and was not ashamed of my being in prison. Oh, good. This, this version does not give the word chain. That's what happens when you use another... Uh, the, 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 the prison means the chain. It does mean it, but I think the New American Standard actually says it, because when I studied it, it was there. Yes, yeah. Okay, and that's very often refreshed me. It was not ashamed of my chains. So, yes, so, I think King James has it, yes. So, if it's meaning it literal, we have enough proof through scriptures to see that chain can be something very literal, and if so, then there is a way to chain the spirit, okay? Now, we're going to see, I hate to leave it here, but especially because we have the Passover next week, then we'll get back to, but we're going to say, see, who it is, who specifically is being chained, okay? We already know that we're going to see him with all his different names. We're going to see what that means. Uh, we're going to see how long he's chained. We're going to see why, I'll, I'll, I'll tip my hand this far. He's chained. He's chained for the thousand years, but you notice the line? After a thousand years, he comes back up. Yes. Why is he released? Hello, oh, God. Why are you releasing him? Come in two weeks and I'll answer it for you. know why. I did. If you get awake and you're listening, you're doing well. You've got the answer. And if you can't wait two weeks, come see me. <laughs> okay, any questions, comments? We're long past time. I hope it was a benefit where we were. We will get through the millennium. I keep thinking we'll get through a lot. Two questions. Yes. When the skeletons being have the apostles and all that, is that just the point there? Ezekiel? Ezekiel's talking about Israel. It's not talking about those in the graves, actually. It's talking about Ezekiel, Israel being back in the land, and they're in the land because God is rebirth or birth nation in a day. But the next chapter shows us and continues. 
the spirit of God is not in them. Yeah. So they have bones, but that's it. They're, they're like dead men walking. Yeah. Okay, any other questions, comments? Thank the Lord. He's our teacher. Okay, we'll close the prayer. Sorry. Okay, I'll make it short. Lord God of heaven and earth, we praise you and we thank you. You're almighty and in control, and we rejoice for the day that is coming when your kingdom will be on earth also, when Satan, our adversary, will be done away. In the meantime, since he still has freedom, Lord God, I pray the hand of protection over each one here, that we will stand strong against his deceitful tax tactics, that we will stay close to you, Lord. Let us glorify you, serve you, and in the midst of that, praise you. We get to be home with you one day soon and very soon. To you be all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.